So this evening, we're going to be looking at 1 John chapter 2, verses 7 to 17. In fact, let me read this for you. Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world or the things of, in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. And this is the reading of God's word. You know, last week we took a small peek at the first part of our vision statement, know Jesus. Next week, we'll unpack the third part of our vision statement, make disciples. And then the following week after that, Bryce is going to help us understand the value of planting churches. But today, we're going to be exploring the meaning behind the second part of our vision statement, love others. Now, you may recall if you've read uh, the Gospel of John in John 13, where Jesus said, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And, you know, I think that just begs the question, would people know that you and I are Jesus's disciples by the way that we love one another? It's an important question, I think, because Jesus said this would be a key distinguishing mark of his followers. Now, in fact, it was it quite possibly is one of the most remarkable things about us as disciples of Jesus Christ. And that's because it, it shows the world that we love like he loved, like Jesus loved. Christians, you see, are meant to be the most love-focused, love-pursuing, love-dispensing people on the face of the earth. So let me ask, is this me? Is this you? Do people describe you and me as remarkably loving? Now, it's great to hear this, but I still think it begs the question, what does it mean to love this way? When we talk about loving others, what does that even look like? And for that matter, how is that even possible? Now, most commonly when we talk about love, it refers to a feeling of strong att attraction and, and, and a, some emotional or deep emotional attachment, which means then that what we love the most is what we naturally give our attention to. So I ask, what is it that I love the most in the whole world? It's an important enough question that John thinks we should ask it in testing where we really stand with God. So let's go to 1 John chapter 2 and see what John has to say about this subject. And as we go through this passage this evening, we can see John giving us polar opposite words like old and new and dark and light and love and hate and young mature and the word and God. What John is telling us through this passage is that there are choices that need to be made and and that these choices are black and white choices. Uh, not the world at the same time doesn't like black and white choices. Because the world tells us that choices are gray at best, doesn't it? The world says that truth is, is what? You remember? Relative. Point is, it's not. The statement that truth is relative is in itself a truth statement. So even there, it defeats its own premise. Truth is not relative. Truth is true. Two plus two equals five every time or six every time. All of us would agree. No, neither of those. Two plus two equals four every single time. John knows that truth is true. And so he identifies for us some black and white decisions that we need to be making in our daily lives. And these are important. So do you want to love or hate? Do you want to live in the dark or in the light? Do you want to be mature or young? Do you want to choose God or the world? And these are all black and white decisions that need to be made. Now, the problem we experience, however, is that though we know that we must choose love over hate, light over dark, maturity over staying immature, and God over the world, we keep falling back into our old natures, don't we? 
Well, in this passage, John tells us who we, how we can actually find true victory over the flesh. The solution to the tension we face is in knowing Jesus intimately or, or knowing God's heart deeply. And we spoke about that last week. So John begins with that same thinking by telling us that we are to choose to love God. And then we're free. Once we do, we're free to love others. In other words, love God so that we can love others. Now, let me ask you a simple question. Do you love your brother and sister in the Lord? Now, most of us, if not all of us, would say, well, of course we do. I may not like some of them, but I definitely love them. Now, if we say that, then why would John say, if any of you hates your brother or your sister? You see, when John says this, he's presupposing that some of us hate our brother or sister. He's not even talking about hating others out there in the big, scary world. He's talking about within the fellowship that there are some who hate each other. And that's a pretty heavy word, hate, don't you think? In fact, in our house, that's one of the dreaded four-letter words. I mean, you just don't say that word, not even about a meal. When most people talk about love and hate, they're usually, usually referring to the feelings that they expect to have. You, you know, love makes the heart beat a little faster and the blood rush to your cheeks. Every time my wife walks in the door, that should be happening to me. My heart flutter and, my, and, I, and I begin to feel all warm and fuzzy. <laughs> At the same time, hate causes your blood pressure to rise and the blood to boil. So most of us thinking about our brothers and sisters in the Lord would say that our blood isn't boiling whenever I think about the folks in my church. I don't feel hate, so I must not obviously hate them. But, but you know what? When John's talking about this, what he's really talking about isn't a feeling. He's talking about an action or maybe in many cases, inaction. Hate literally means to not demonstrate love in action. I don't know if you've ever thought about it that way. In other words, if you're not demonstrating love, the alternative is that you hate. Now, remember, this is coming from a place where John is coming from. He is about the black and the white. So if you don't love, you hate is what he's getting at. I also think it's important to recognize that love in action isn't just about acting it out by writing love letters or even saying, oh, I love you. As nice as that might sound, and it's not wrong to do those things, but that's not what he's talking about. It doesn't even mean that you show it by baking cookies, so that's a good thing too. Nor does it mean that I'm not showing love if, if I don't help you move for the 20th time. What it does mean is this. Do I continually look out for your best interests over mine? Do I consider you as more important than myself? Do I find that I can't help? but pray for you at any given time in the day that you come to mind, and so I pray for you. Do I bake cookies for you simply because you love cookies and not because I'm trying to prove to the world that I love you? Do I help you move for the 21st time because it'll bless you and not because I feel it's my duty? Love is a sacrificial action. The question is, if I'm not loving as I described, then why not? Here's why not. The reason we're not loving as described, which if you remember is actually hate, is because we're walking in darkness, not in light. Now, you might think to yourself, hey, I'm not walking in darkness. But John is saying that you'll know that you're walking in darkness or light by the things you are doing or not doing for one another. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 34, Jesus shares what I find to be one of the clearest passages in Scripture about what it means to love on our brothers and sisters in the Lord. Let me read that to you. Matthew chapter 25, verse, starting at verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? or a stranger and show you hospitality, or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Now, here's what this is talking about. When you serve others out of love, when you bake those cookies for another and help your buddy move for the 22nd time for no other reason than because you love them, then you don't even keep track because you just do it. But God keeps track, and it's as though you did those things for him. And that's the idea behind the commandment Jesus gave in Luke 10, love your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength, and to love your neighbors yourself. 
Now let's take a look at uh, Matthew 25, uh, starting at verse 41, and see the continuation of that same story. Then the king will return to those on his left, and he'll say, away with you, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. For I was hungry, and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, and you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked, and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison, and you didn't visit me. Then they will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison not help you? And he'll answer, I tell you the truth. When you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you are refusing to help me. And they'll go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. I mean, wow, amazing. I mean, did you see what was happening here? This second group of people were showing hate, not love, by their inaction to love on others. And it cost them big time. Listen, church, the litmus test, if you're in the dark and the light, is whether you're loving one another. I mean, there's not much great in that test, is there? So the question I think we need to be asking of ourselves is this. What evidence do you have that you actually love your brother and sister? Now, please, as I share this, please understand my heart. I, I'm not trying to get heavy on us here. I believe I'm actually asking that question for the same reason that Jesus gave the warning. It's the most loving thing I can do. And that's because many, many people are stuck in darkness, even though they think that they're in the light. I thought I knew darkness, by the way, until I entered a potash mine in Saskatchewan. Night isn't really darkness. You can always make out something, whether it's because of the stars overhead or because of the moon shining or a light off in the distance. You can always even see some kind of silhouette if you look hard enough. But um, we were two kilometers underground when I was in this potash mine. And when they turn off the light, I have to tell you, it was the inkiest, blackest, most tangible darkness I had ever experienced. It was so dark, you felt like you'd almost hold it in your hand. It, 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 you could almost taste it. You could almost see it. I know it sounds weird, but it was, it was that dark and thick and inky and black. By the way, I don't know if you know this, but, that, but darkness isn't actually a thing. Darkness is the absence of light. Just like hate isn't really a thing, hate is the absence of love displayed in action. If you aren't doing things for your brother simply because you love him, John says that you're in darkness and so proves you aren't loving your brother. And so then you're hating him. There's no wiggle room here, by the way. But we disciples of Jesus, I, I know we don't want to do that. So what do we want to do? We, we want to love. But that is so hard to do, which is why it's amazing when Jesus comes along and tells us that he's given us a brand new commandment. And the reason John says that this new commandment is not really new is because the basis of it had been around right from the very beginning. Now, the difference is, is what Jesus said after he said to love one another, where he said, and just as I've loved you, you are to love one another. Did you notice the new element that Jesus had added there? The old commandment said to go love each other, but then we're left to go figure it out on our own. The problem is, is that we can't figure it out. We just can't do it. But Jesus comes along and says, I'm giving you a new commandment. And the way I want you to do this is by following my example. And even better, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to live in you in order to enable you to do it. Because as we all know, the Christian life isn't difficult. It's impossible, which is why, church, we need the Holy Spirit. Now, the question remains, if we have the example and we have the aid of the Holy Spirit, why then don't we love as we should? Well, then Jesus gives us the answer. You look again in verse 11, and he says, but whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now, I think that's a really interesting phrase, don't you think? We don't say blinded by the darkness. What do we normally say? We'd say blinded by the light. Ever step out of a dark room into bright sunlight? What happens? We're blinded momentarily, aren't we? But here's the thing. That's temporary. What John is talking about is something permanent, and it actually makes more sense. You can't see in darkness, can you? Especially if it's in a potash mine with all the lights turned off. See, we want to Im imitate Christ. We want to follow his example. But here's the challenge. If you can't see Jesus, you can't follow him. So what John is saying is that if you're living in darkness, you can't see Jesus to follow him. And that means then that there's no way you can love each other because we know that this is an old commandment and it fails unless we can see Jesus, who is the light of the world. And as soon as you step out of the darkness into the light and you can see Jesus, what do we do? 
We follow him. This is what uh, Peter said in verse Peter chapter 2. To this you have been called because Christ suffered for you, leaving an example that you should follow in his steps. Look to Jesus. You see, only he can help us. I mean, I can't lead you. If you follow me and love others as I love them, that love will always be imperfect. That'd be like getting someone who's never driven a car before to teach you how. I mean, bad idea. Who knows how to love us best? Jesus does. So how do we step out of darkness into light? We choose to love God and those he loves. And we invite the Holy Spirit to give us the power to actually love as we must and eyes to see the light so that we can see Jesus and follow his example. Okay, good stuff so far, but not only do we choose to love God and love others even more than we love ourselves, we must also choose to stop loving the world. So it's one thing to say to love God, but then the polar opposite is to stop loving the world. And why? Because love for God and love for the world can't coexist. I mean, verse 15 of 1 John says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, the very essence of, of our nature is desire. There's nobody listening to this message who doesn't want something. Every heart loves something. Every heart desires something. At the center of our heart is this deep longing. And a longing is a craving. It's a desire. It's a want. It's a need. A longing is like a drain or, or a vacuum. At the center of our heart is a sucking drain, like the bottom of a swimming pool. We are endlessly thirsty, but we can't but we can't continue to suck water and air at the same time. That's a challenge. If you try to satisfy your cravings by sucking in the air of the world, you'll not be able to drink the water of heaven. And eventually your mortar will end up burning up because we were made to pump the living water of God, not the polluted air of the world, church. Now you might be asking, what's this world that we're not to love? Well, verse 16, he goes on and he says, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. Now, there are three things that he identifies here. There's this desire for physical pleasures or lust of the flesh, desire for the things we see or the lust of the eyes, and the pride of doing things and getting stuff. And we can see how the three descriptions of the world relate to each other. The first two, desires of the flesh and desires of the eyes, refers to desires for what we don't have. And the third, the pride of life, refers to the pride in what we do have. And the world is driven by these two things, passion for pleasure and pride in possessions. If you don't have it, it can fill you with a passion to get it. If you can get it, it can fill you with the pride that you got it. The common den denominator being that these passions are not sustainable, and they're definitely not soul satisfying, not eternally, because they are so temporal, which is why the psalmist says in Psalm, 30, or, uh, Psalm 73, rather, whom have I in heaven but you, and the earth has nothing I desire besides you. Anything in this world that is not God can rob your heart of the love of God. Not only that, but anything that is not God can draw your heart away from God. Now, John could have stopped here at the end of verse 16. Don't love the world because love for the world can coexist with, God, with love for God. But he doesn't. He has two more reasons not to love the world. Look at in, in, in verse 17. Notice that he says this at the first part of verse 17. And the world is passing away along with its desires. Listen. Nobody would knowingly buy stock in a company that's about to go bankrupt. Not knowingly, anyways. Nobody knowingly settles in to enjoy a cruise in a sinking ship. If everybody knew that about the Titanic, nobody would have gotten on in the first place in 1912. No reasonable person would lay up treasure where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal, would they? Listen, the world is passing away. So to set your heart on it, on it is only asking for heartbreak in the end. Because if you love the world, it will pass away and it will take you with it. But then secondly, John continues on in the same verse, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Listen, the opposite of loving the world is not only loving the Father, as we read in verse 15, but also doing the will of the Father, as we just read in verse 17. And that connection is not hard to understand. Where Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments in verse 15 of John chapter 14. In other words, if you love God, you're going to love, you will love what he loves. And if you do, John is saying in verse 17, that you'll get to live with him forever. You'll have a renewed relationship with him. So instead of passing away with the world, you can live forever in the full pleasure of the heavenly father, which is what we originally created to experience. You know, this evening, I want to invite each of you to respond with, uh, to what we've heard. 
you know, uh, I, I want you to invite you to respond in one or, or all three other ways I'm going to share right now. Now, if you were live with us, you would have experienced the band playing. And, uh, and so I want to encourage you to even maybe play some worship music and spend some time uh, listening to some praise songs to, with the Lord. But another way is I want to invite you to pray. And even let me know, send me an email or, or put a, post a message on this YouTube as you've listened to this message and say you would love some prayer. And I would promise uh, to be praying for you. And, uh, and so I want to encourage you to respond that way. Ask for prayer. Another way is to, uh, is to share in your giving as a form of worship. Now that's if you're a regular listener and a regular attender. Giving is a way, you see, of giving back to the word of God and to his work and to the continuous of ministry, uh, continuance of ministry and as a way of thanking God for his generos generosity to us. And so feel free to respond in those ways as well as you ponder what God has spoken to in your heart. But finally, let me suggest that the third way to respond is to spend time while you're listening to some, some of this worship music to reflect on how you're going to apply what you heard during this message this evening. Did this message call for a change in your life? And if so, what? What's that change? Are you encouraged even out of this to tell others about Jesus and the glorious message of hope that you heard tonight? And what will you do this week to actually apply what you learned? And I'd love to hear your stories and share with me on email or, or again, uh, post it on this YouTube video of what you've learned from this. Now, possibly even while I've been uh, preaching, some of you might be saying, I don't feel a whole lot of love for God right now. And there's a couple of possible reasons for that. One is the possibility that you actually might not be born again. Maybe, maybe you think you have, and maybe you, or maybe you just never assumed a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you haven't even thought about it. And having a relationship with God the Father has never crossed your mind before today. Or it's possible that you're a regular attender and regular listener to these messages, and you have all the words down pat. But you got to know, attending church or serving in the church or saying all the right words or even being a leader in the church does not make you a Christian. So you might want to consider the fact that you may never have experienced a deep, deep change in your nature by the power of the Holy Spirit, which gives birth to a new love for God. So it could be that this conversion has never happened to you and that your religion is all outward form and not an inner experience of the love of God. Or maybe, again, maybe you've just never experienced it in the first place or thought you've experienced it in the first place. Now, if either of those is for you, you can direct your heart to Jesus and seek to know him intimately today. And, 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 and ask him, invite him to take over your life and invite him to, um, to uh, become your Lord and Savior. Get into his word. Get a hold of myself or somebody else you know who's experienced the intimate love of this relationship with Jesus that will awaken your heart to love him with your whole heart, your soul, mind, and strength, and love, love your neighbors yourself. Another possibility is that you're not feeling love for God and others right now because maybe it may be that you have actually been born again, but your love for God has simply grown cool and weak. And I mean, you've tasted what it means to have a heart for God. You can recall how once you felt that to know him intimately was so much better than anything uh, before that you felt, especially more than the world could offer. But now it's like the, the wick on your candle of, of life and hope is smoldering and maybe you feel somewhat numb. You know what? The prescription for you is actually not much different than the prescription for seeking new birth in the first place. You see, it's because the same spirit that gives life also nourishes life. The same word that ignites the fire of love also rekindles love. The same Jesus who once brought you out of darkness into his marvelous light can take away the long, dark night of your soul. So yield yourself to the Holy Spirit. Immerse yourself in the word of God. Cry out to Jesus for a new vision of the glory of his grace. And don't be content with lukewarmness. Pursue a new passion for Christ. Commit to getting to know Jesus intimately. Now, whichever of these groups you're in, or if your heart is full of love for God the Father, continue to or begin to choose to love Jesus the most above everything else. Improve that love by loving others and loving on your brother and sister in the Lord.